Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, Clayton from XY Advisor. Today I got Conrad Travers, one of the best names. Dude, the way that that name just rolls off the tongue. Turns out I just learnt Conrad Mead's wise counsel and could that not be more appropriate? Mate, thanks for coming on. Pleasure to be here. So uh, I get the I get a lot of exposure to a lot of people in financial advice and we've had some conversations and your take on a lot of things, actually probably I'll use my words better, your, your experience and insight is uh, is more unique, uh, more specialized than I would say most advisors and most other people, especially when it comes to things like compliance. Now, um, c- compliance may sound boring, but I think the whole industry at this stage is like, oh my God, just like, can we just sort it out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's just yep. get it sorted so that we can move on, right? And, um, and so, uh, you come at compliance from like a top-down sort of view. You're you're less interested in the uh, in the nitty gritty, or at least in the conversations we've had. And you're more interested in like h- how can we solve problems from a, a higher level. Yeah. Um. I know very much. Your uh, if we can secure the funding, you're going to play a huge role in uh, X Y's uh, desire to get upfront tax deductibility uh, advice. Um, especially because, you know, a lot of these um, new rules and regulations that are coming off the back of Phasia, it's looking like advisors won't even be able to charge uh, fees from super. So all of a sudden this becomes super, super important. But at the moment, that is a, it's uh, it's almost a minor issue if you consider everything with Phasia going on at the moment. And hopefully I'll have a podcast on that coming up pretty shortly. Um, but I wanted to talk to you, or, or more so, I wanted to introduce your brain to the wider uh, financial advice uh, community because uh, you got some really good insights, and the better equipped I think the whole industry is, then the quicker we can get things on the right path, which is what we're all about. So, um, so let's sort of start something um, that you uh, I've heard you say before, which is we need to get associations, licensees. Uh, uh, and the advisors all on the same page in terms of what is compliance and how we can, uh, you know, make everything more streamlined. Can you go into a little bit of detail around that? Yeah, sure. And look, I think um, at the association level, I think there's a need for uh, a little bit more uni- unified voice facing into some of the issues that we've got. Um, I kind of understand why we've got the, you know, the FPA, the AFA, the PIFA, the UFAA, the SMSFA, right? Yeah. But um, one of the things with politicians is you never win unless you're on the same page and united, right? So that's kind of something where I feel like we don't necessarily need to merge those organizations, um, but we need to have kind of what are our top three kind of priorities, right? So whether it's LIF or the Code of Ethics or how we can support small businesses um, that are really struggling on the back of the Royal Commission recommendations. Um, I think we need to rally around those three key messages. So that'd be kind of at the industry association level. Um, at the licensee level, what I'm seeing, because I've got you know licensees as clients of mine, um, is that everyone's struggling with the same issues. <laughs> yeah. So we have 25,000 advisors, you know, two and a half thousand licensees. I can see with the big five slash big six with IWF um, really spending a lot of money on their compliance frameworks and processes. Um, you've got the mid-tier licensees who are now attracting a lot of advisors. Um, yeah. But also there's a, probably two tiers of mid-tier. There's the ones that have kind of been through the 
the journey with ASIC. Maybe, maybe they've had an EU in the past and they yeah. can't get it and are trying to develop it out. And chatting with Centerpoint is a perfect example of that, right? Yeah, like exactly. They, they, um, the way they talk about it is, uh, sounds, you know, that they've been strung up yeah. and uh, they know exactly what it means. So, yeah, so yeah. it's kind of like one of those things once you've seen all those issues you can you can kind of know what it's like it's a bit like having a having a child it's not like until you know <laughs> until you've been there you don't know what it's like yeah and there's no kind of book that can tell you um so i just think there's an opportunity for us at the licensee level to get together to try and solve issues in a better way i don't think that two and a half thousand licensees individually trying to solve these issues is going to work yeah i, I want to d- duck into that because um the way that you talk about it, it, you you come to different conclusions than the conclusions I've come to. So I wanted to sort of pick your brain around that a little. Um, my view is uh, with with you know especially the big four getting out of advice. Let's call it A and P are kind of signaling they're trying to get out of advice, but let's call it that I aren't. So let's call it the big one. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, by virtue, then, the dealer groups that are going to be best positioned to take in the majority of these uh, advisors are the larger SMEs, uh, the small to medium enterprises. Um, and then uh, you've got a massive, massive, massive tail, right, of the one and two man uh, bands, um, you know, licensees. So the way that I see it is, um, the big end of town, it's risky, right? I mean, I, currently IWF, as far as I can tell, are definitely planning on growing, right? And they're, uh, they're doing a really good job um, with their aligned services and their um, dealer groups. So they're really sort of sticking to it, which is great to see. Um, but then let's say I'm an advisor. I know that it's just a policy change away, a singular policy change away, which we've seen with A&P. That puts my business at risk. So then I go, okay, cool. So these larger, call them private, right, dealer groups, um, they're set up. They've been around for a long time. But then I look at, you know, something like Dover, right? And sure, there may be extemporaneous issues which cause the issue there. But as far as I can tell, ASIC, it's a policy change on their behalf. Well, not even policy change. It's just a decision on their behalf and then my business is at risk. Right, so then I go this massive long tail of private small um, appeals to me as an advisor because at least I'm the only person who is putting my business at risk. I'm not. I'm not subject to uh, you know ASIC's not going to come after me because I'm tiny, right? Unless I'm doing something wrong, which I'm not going to, right? Which, yeah, and this is the part where I want to discuss with you. So to me, it makes sense to go uh, small and private and, and by yourself. Um, I know that's counter to what you, you believe. And out of the two of us, you're more experienced than me. So I feel like I'm wrong. So please tell me why. And look, there is no crystal ball. So sure. you know, like who knows? But um, I guess when I look at the self-licensing thing and like I've written about this and um, – I got told, you know, I'm too institutional in my view, but I'm trying to think about how to protect and look after people who may not be aware of some of the risks that they're taking. What are they? So, for example, um, if you're self-licensed, you're effectively moving from running a set of uh, looking after a set of clients to running a licensee. So, running a licensee is a totally different skill set to running a book of clients. Hundred percent. So um, my view, and I'm trying to think two, three years ahead, not not now, Absolutely. is that the future regulatory change will impose additional costs and complexity on those licensees. Now, most of those smaller licensees are outsourcing their, um, you yes. know, their compliance and their policy work and yes. their audit framework. However, those people are responsible for that licensee. Yes. So I look at that and sort of think, uh, kind of understand why someone may want to do that, um, com- completely get your point around the autonomy piece. Yeah. Um, the challenge, I think, will come when the detail of this regulatory change comes through. So even though we're feeling like now is really heavy on regulatory change with the Royal Commission and FASIA, et cetera, next year there's a whole raft of new stuff coming, right? So so my point is like how do you deal with that if you're a small um, licensee? So you obviously you partner with someone who can give you guidance around that. Correct. I would just argue that if you are um, having a, someone run your compliance committee and produce a set of policies for you, 
that they may not have enough capacity themselves to deal with what's going to happen. In my view. Okay. Um, now that sounds that sounds like an educated opinion. So uh, can I dive into what is coming next year? Yeah, with sure. you. What what what's what what is the uh, what are the things that we can expect to see that are coming next year? What what are they? So we've already seen obviously the grandfathered commission piece. Yep. Uh, we've got the annual review annual renewal of uh, ongoing service mm-hmm. arrangements. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to see things like, um, I don't know, do you know what the ABA protocol is? So, no. So this is where the, the Australian Bankers Association have a, a, a system where there's a reference checking for new advisors. Only applies to the ABA. So if someone applies to be part of the licensee, they can kind of uh, ask for a reference from an existing licensee or a previous one. So Hain has recommended that, that becomes uh, a nationwide or sorry, industry-wide initiative. So even though that seems like a simple thing, because I've done these things before, I know the devil's in the detail. Um, so when you look at that and you go, you're a small licensee, you've received one of these checks, you may comply with that reference check, but have you thought about things like privacy? If you have a salaried uh, advisor who may have committed, I don't know, some sort of HR issue, do you disclose that? Do you not disclose that? If they've had an audit history where there's an adverse rating, um, but they've challenged that rating. Do you tell the person who's taking on that advisor about that or do you breach um, confidentially around around that? So this is the detail that I think that um, we need to work through when rolling out sort of a wide sweeping regulatory change. And I'm not saying that everyone must join a mid-tier. I'm not even, I'm just saying if you go self-license, be aware of the risks, plan for the risks. Yep and have the right framework in place to deal with what's not just what's happening now, but what will happen in the future. Yeah, that's tough, hey? It is. So where do you believe is the safest option? Is it the big one, <laughs> big six, or whatever? Um, is it the large mid-tier, medium mid Is it the large private, medium private, small private, or... I guess what you've already given your answer as to whether you should be totally self licensed. Look, I, it's a good question. My answer is more like if someone said to you, "What's a good investment?" Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, it depends. Yeah, yeah. It depends on the person. Yeah. Depends what's important to them. Um, what I would say to to people is, if they're thinking about choosing a licensee at the moment, is think about like the bare, the basic things that have to be there. What such as so financial stability. And, and that means how much money do you have in the bank account in order to pay for any future breaches? Is that a part of it? No, I'd be looking for a licensee that's, um, if not on the way, but you know, profit neutral. Sure. Because when you take away vertical integration, that licensee is going to need to stand on its own two legs in the future. Yeah. So that's the first thing I'd look for. The second thing is um, the depth and complexity of the compliance framework. Um, so not just have they got policies in a risk committee, do they look at things like consequence management? You know, what's the quality of their training? How good are they on X plan? Oh, whatever the CRM system might be. Shouldn't, yep, yep, shouldn't yep. assume it's just X plan, but that's yep. the majority of people. Yep. Um, so I'd go right into the detail around those types of things and then test that with other advisors and see what they think. Because, you know, a smaller player could be completely appropriate for someone, but you need to go through that process first. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, all right, well, pivoting just slightly, where do you see advice in five years? So what I've had a lot, of, a lot of time to think about this. So what I reckon is um, obviously the advisor number is going to shrink. So, to how small? So look, my uh, again, there's no crystal ball, but I think <laughs> by 2025, I think advisor's numbers will come down by 40%. So we're talking 15,000 odd. Okay. Um, that, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's, a lot of, that's, that's a lot of advisors uh, that's, you know, that yeah. would be out. So, and the one caveat to that is if the LIF reforms come through, I think it could be closer to 50 or 60%. Ooh. Now, that is, that is a doomsday scenario, but I think um, it's not unrealistic when you look at the number of people who are you know, considering whether they want to do the study, um, moving into non-executive roles, maybe moving into other advice-related roles. We've already seen 3,000 um People leave the industry in the first six months of the year. So um, I don't think it's unrealistic. Whether it's a good thing for the industry is, is, is debatable. Um, but that's. But I also see on the back of that, um, from 20, 2025 to 2030, 
the new graduates coming through, I see new brands emerging that are uh, really kind of advice focused that, that the new staff will join. So I see the numbers actually recovering to where they are now by 2030, but I think we're going to have to go through a dip first. Well, at least it's good news for Grad Mentor. Do you know Ali Bar? I do, yes. <laughs> Should be very good for his business. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay, in- interesting. Um, so in the future, you, you think, and, and I think there's, a, there's an argument to say, are people that expect, you know, as they walk into the industry, expect to have certain levels of education. It's, it's less harsh on them to, to deliver, you know, coming in, I was sort of, I came in, or at least I started my company just before FOFA came in um, to effect. So I, I was essentially a, a, call it a FOFA baby. Um, and I didn't really mind, you know, a lot of that stuff because um, I, I'd, I'd been focused on it for the last few years anyway in, in power planning. And, and by the time uh, I was out on my own, it was like, okay, well, it's, it's so be it. And so I think you're probably right in that the the new um, graduates that come in are just future focused, and yeah. and I th- I think that's probably a a, uh, a safe place to be. Um, so, uh, what is your take on the code of ethics? Yeah, look, it's a really good question. I like I th- I read the guidance, I read the note. Um, I think that kind of get where it's coming from but I think it's a missed opportunity in the sense that um, it's just so hard to interpret and it starts in like 45 days right so like I think um, yeah. everyone's talking about standard three that basically says if you have a, a conflict of interest you cannot act further and that's just such a motherhood statement that it's impossible to interpret the explanatory guide wasn't that helpful either uh, in the examples that it chose it didn't talk about vertical integration and they're really kind of media issues um my main piece of advice um well, i've got a few pieces of advice but one is best interest sits above everything so if in the absence of having a central monitoring body which we won't have for 2020 it's going to be the licensees themselves have to enforce it um, always focused on giving advice that delivers best interest so the basic the basics of um fact find diary note soa and that proving that you've established best interest um, applies even more so. I think um, there's a couple of things that are really clear in that um, referral fees are going to be a challenge. So if someone's getting um, fees for referring business to an accountant or a lawyer, I'd kind of think about that through 2020. Um, And then also percentage-based ASF. Um, I think with the variable remuneration guidelines, that that may be on the way out. So... um, Now, having said that, there's a lot of advisors who'd be really frustrated by that because they've built their business based on percentage-based ASF. Um, So it's really about that transition phase. And and ASIC has sort of said 2020 is the year of um, no enforcement, so it's our our chance to get it it right. Um, But the challenge also will be for the licensees to interpret it. So if they do get a breach, they need to have a framework to actually assess through their incident management process or their audit framework whether that's reportable. What about the, because we've seen it, this look back, right? What happens if they say no enforcement for 2020 and then in 2025 they go, actually, we're going to look back and enforce 2020? Is that a possibility? It is. Um, And look, I think you've got to look at it from ASIC's point of view. So ASIC got um, towelled in the Royal Commission. Their budget's up 20%. They are there to enforce the law, right? Yeah, they've got additional powers now, right? Yeah. Uh, pa- the intervention powers. And they're starting from the perspective of um, why would we not litigate? Woo. So they're not... And, and But they're not... Are they going to litigate against a small licensee? They're not. Probably not. Because th- there's no money there to win. But who knows? Because there's a couple of things that are going to change. Uh, so one is they're going to use um, data analytics more. So how can they, for example... They may go out to all their licensees because they have obviously the contacts for that and say, mm-hmm. give us information on X, right? So they could, that's what I call a spray notice or it's a, they're fishing for information. And as a licensee, you need to hit the date, respond to them with the facts. A lot of times, because I've done a, you know, a number of ASIC notices, you don't always have the information to hand to respond to them. So you've got to go out to the field, ask for information. You've got paper-based files, information not stored on CRMs. 
So all those kind of housekeeping issues that advisors get frustrated about being reminded of come to light when you get an ASIC notice. Yeah, and you've worked on a few of them, haven't you? Yeah, I have, yeah. Yeah. What do you, what do you find is typically the biggest red flag for, from, from ASIC's point of view? What's the, what, what is, what's the one that ASIC's going to go after because everyone forgets and then it's what gets everyone in trouble? What's, what's the big puppy? I don't know if there's one thing. I think, I think obviously, um, fee for no service is a focus at the moment. Let's go into what that actually means. So, um, you know, what I've heard is, uh, if you offer a meeting and then they don't come, is that now fee for no service? Yeah, it's a really simple question. I have to give you a reasonably complicated answer. Sorry. I, no, fantastic. That's why, because I'm rather confused by it. Yeah. By it, so. Yeah. So I think a lot of the licensees have given guidance to advisors in the past that the, an offer of review is sufficient. Yeah, that's what um, I've heard. Because if you offer the review and the client decides not to come in, yeah, it's outside your control, right? Yeah, yep. The challenge with that is when you look at the fee for no service remediation for the big four banks, in those scenarios, um, they have looked to pay out in those scenarios because... ASIC's view, and they've clarified this with a regulatory guide they've um, released recently, and Haynes has been very, very clear on this, that um, simply offering a review is not substantively delivering the service. Um, so my advice for anyone around fee for, fee for no service is a couple of things. One is limit your services to no more than two or three that you contractually um, say to the client, this is what I'll provide. Oh, right. So on, on like your annual fee disclosure statement, limit the amount of things yeah interesting now if you deliver the, the seminar or the investment alert or the um you know whatever it might be the the birthday cake or whatever yeah <laughs> put that in your marketing brochure but what really matters is your contractual um, arrangements for what you will deliver yeah and then once you've got sort of down to two or three and it's probably going to be an annual review and access to your advisor or something like that ensure that your crm proves that you've delivered that service through the year um, if you do that, you should be okay. But for example, we see fee disclosure statements is one of the biggest um, incident issues that we have in the, in the industry in the sense that the, the fee disclosure statement won't always line up to the ongoing service agreement. That's one. Or someone may view that they've got um, 60 days to deliver the, the fee disclosure statement after the end of the year, um, but the ASIC's view is it's plus 59. So if they go to 61, they're actually technically in breach. Right. So there's a thousand little things like that. Okay. Um, Sorry if that's too complicated. Mate, no, 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 because uh, I, I've just I've seen both sides of that coin. That's why I asked such a simple question because mm. uh, I've heard so many different conflicting sort of results. Can I just add one more thing? Absolutely. If anyone out there gets an ASIC notice, yep. here's my advice. Yeah. Number one, pause. <laughs> Yeah. Don't do anything. Yeah. Get advice and get legal advice. Do you have someone you recommend? No, no, I'm not going to recommend anyone. Okay. But what All I mean right. is someone who's experienced in um, either the Corp- Corporations Act. Can or they call you? <laughs> uh, look, maybe. It depends what they need. But sure. look, what I'd say is um, just take your time. Recognize the role of what ASIC's trying to do. Yeah. Don't try and build a relationship with them or manage the situation. Um, just respond professionally with fact-based information and hit the deadline, but get some legal advice around that. The, the worst thing you can do is kind of just respond yourself without really thinking it through. Yeah, um, I know, because I know exactly what you there's always something behind why they're, what they're asking. Yeah. What, what would be a classic thing that they would ask? So it could be, for example, can you give me uh, a sample of 10 fee disclosure statements given in the last 12 months for a set of clients? Uh, it could be... So so you're saying don't just pu- pull them out in 15 minutes and send it to them? Well, in that scenario, you, maybe you could. Yeah. But I'd still chat to a lawyer. Um, okay, cool. And then, and then kind of draft up a response. Okay. Um, it may be that they're after something in, in more depth. They must, might ask for a specific... If an issue's occurred that's been reported to ASIC, they're probably going to ask for the file in relation to that. So that's a matter. You can just provide the file. So it's pretty simple. Yep. Um, but it may be in relation to a more thematic issue. Like, for example, if someone's uh, been reported for a sole purpose breach, they're going to ask for additional clients' information about whether that's a more systemic issue. So it depends yeah. on what it is. With um, 
So if you do look at the sole purpose test, it's you know, used for the purposes of retirement and ancillary benefits such as insurance. And that's kind of on, um, that's kind of been, I guess. It's an elephant in the room. I reckon, I reckon it's going to. The ancillary benefits? It's so funny. Well. It's when... just, there's only one purpose, except for this other purpose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of funny like and they even call it the sole purpose test it's yeah. like it only has one purpose it's really got two yeah. <laughs> and, and that second one is open for interpretation yeah. but it, look it's, it's another example of how we've kind of not done a great job of advising and guiding advisors in my view and well when you say who's we so like like we're all to blame really like the industry so so one thing that might be interesting for advisors to know is like the other side of the fence when you're on the licensee side yeah so on the licensee side, you've, you've typically got um, limited resources. Oh, of course. So you've got, you know, maybe five or six people and together they've got to do the conference, they've got to do the, the email newsletter, they've got to do all of your policies, they've got to do your frameworks, uh, X-Plan training, all the rest of it, right? So they themselves are scrambling just to keep up. 100%. To be honest. Yeah, no, I believe you. And this regulatory change keeps coming. Yeah. And so that, that means that sometimes things come down to the advisors a bit half baked because you, <laughs> you may have a yes. date you may have a date that you've got to hit and you've mm. just got to get something out right yeah so i kind of get it from the advisor's point of view where they're like can you guys just get your act together yeah and make things clear what's up with this look back can can we dive into this because um the concept that you can be retrospectively punished that just blows my mind like how how cuz advisors have and do do their best to keep up with all the regulation changes, which there are mountains of. Yeah. And then, so how can you get to the end of it and be like, oh, actually, we're going to judge the stuff that, you know, because I, I had this discussion with someone the other day. Realistically, file notes, something as simple as file notes were considered um, unique in 2012, 2000, maybe even 13, you know, that, that's not that long ago. And something as simple as a file note was like, huh, what's a file note, right? So how how can, and which really came in after, after FOFA, right? That was when everyone was like, okay, I 100% have to do these file notes. So how can you... Look, how can how can how can the justification come? I'm I'm genuinely confused. How can the justification come for looking back at and judging something that's a decade ago? Look, you're singing to the choir. I get it. Um, so yeah. I'm on the same page. The problem is, it, if it does happen, you're going to need to think through the processes that you have to respond to that. Um, so. Like we, I know that we've had lookbacks and you know the big the big four plus plus AMP and it's been quite a detailed piece of work. Will ASIC go to that level with the other ones? I'm not sure, um, but who knows? Like I think that um, we have to. Res- I don't think that you can apply. The, the thing that ASIC is looking at is they don't they don't care about how we feel right now. No, of course not. So they're looking at the advice and they're usually lawyers who look at this and they look at the file. So this is why I always go back to the basics of um, fact find diary note and SOA and that telling a story. One of the things that advisors need to get good at is thinking like, even though, you know, the C word compliance they hate, yeah. thinking like auditors going, okay, I had this great conversation with this client. It went really well. The way that I've documented it, does it tell the why of how I got to the advice that I did? Mm. And that's the piece that they need to work on. Um, so I think that, um, can't control the past. If it happens, it happens. Let's get advice around it. But going forward, make sure that your um, your processes are really tight around that documentation side. So potentially, you know, once the uh, advice has been, once the SOA has been delivered um, and, and implementation begins, you're suggesting potentially maybe just sit down and write a couple of hundred words on the journey. Like this person came in, this is what was happening. No, 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 not, not that. No, so the why. So, so the... Um, the diary note should explain the why. Okay. Okay. So, so at, at the, but you don't you, so, so you the, don't necessarily know what the advice is going to be in the first meeting. So the let's call it the diary note won't explain the why because you haven't. Yeah, and this is where I think yet. you need to add a bit more color to going. So you might do um, a first appointment diary note, yep. and then in addition to that, some working papers on. You know, this is the different recommendations that I looked at. The strategies. This yep. is the reasons why. Yeah. You just got to take people on a bit of a journey about how you got to the 
the final recommendation in the SOA. So I'm not saying do a document afterwards that retrofits the advice. I'm just saying th think go from A to B to C to get the bouncing ball, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, so, it's such a weird one, though, because, like, when you're, when you're sitting down and thinking, sometimes you don't write it. Well, a lot of the times you don't write it down. It's very hard to document a thought process. Yep. So you're saying, I understand it's difficult. Do it anyway. Correct. Because <laughs> part of my job is to tell people not what they want to hear but what they need to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a view as to uh, I don't think anyone disagrees with what um, ASIC and FASI are trying to achieve and the government for that matter, which is like we want everyone, every single stakeholder wants ad, uh, clients to feel comfortable with getting advice and to get advice that's good for them. Yeah. And uh, that unanimously across all stakeholders is what 100% of each part of that supply chain wants. Um, and then it gets more difficult the further you go into that conversation as to what that means mm. and how to achieve it. Um, if you were to take an absolutist view, which we've arrived at, right? So Fassier has said, okay, so no conflicts, uh, which is a very, very absolutist view. So then um, why can't they just say no commissions? And not that everyone's going to be stoked about that, but at least that would clarify what it means. Because take no conflicts to, um, what is it, ad absurdum? We, we just take it to the, ad, the absurd, right? The extreme. The extreme, right? Yep. So two people, you do two initial meetings. Uh, my one o'clock meeting, they can afford my fee. My two o'clock meeting, they either can't afford my fee or, uh, no, let's just keep it simple. They can't afford my fee. I'm conflicted because one's going to pay me and one is not going to pay me. So I'm conflicted in what I'm going to provide for them. I'm going to provide person one o'clock appointment advice and I'm not going to provide advice for the 2 p.m. client. That's a conflict. Yeah, and look, <laughs> I don't... As soon as you put a dollar sign on a bit of paper yeah. or in a business model which it's not a business model if it, doesn't have a docu if it doesn't have a dollar sign, you get a conflict. I don't disagree with you. I don't have all the answers. I think one of the interesting things is that um, I think uh, uh, Glenfield, when he was at the Senate committee, uh, he was asked this question and grilled pretty hard on this standard. And I think he said, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that commissions were okay but best interest said above it. So I, I think that um, in some ways that standard three is a bit of Fascia saying here's the bar – Mm. industry you interpret it how you see um not that you can't have x there's my interpretation i could be wrong by the way i could well be wrong sure 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 um, no i understand that but i think it's not enough to do nothing about this yep even in the absence of um clear guidance yep i think licensees should take steps now between now and 1 january to implement policy changes and think about how that integrate the the you know the tenets and the standards of the code of ethics even if it is ambiguous yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I think, do you think, do you think, do you think there's a possibility that we'll see a delay so that the 1st of January 2020 is no longer the deadline? Have you heard anything whatsoever that would possibly suggest that we're not going to implement a code that is and this is not meant to be insulting, but it's half baked in that yeah. everyone's confused. So, um, is have you heard anything? Anywhere? I've heard nothing. I think there's yeah. probably a very small chance. Oh man! And really? the reason I say that is because ASIC has said it's a 12 month no enforcement period. So that's that's them saying. But then I'm so terrified as a, 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 a as a, from an advisor point of view, I'm terrified of a look back. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, whew, what do you do? Do you do, like what? Uh, Just keep, keep giving great advice and make sure you document it really well. Give great service. Yeah. Um, control the things that you can control right now, and make sure it's all on your file. That's about it. 
and, right. and, and, and really get to... I think the other thing that comes to light when there is regulatory action is the importance of the CRM system, so the technology side of things. Yes. So really spend time training and understanding the threads, the processes that you can automate. The more that you can reduce human risk um, into the process is really important. Um, yeah. I've, I mean, we could debate this all day, couldn't we? It's, Absolutely. Um, uh, I would have loved for you to have, you know, handed manna down from heaven and be like, oh, do this. <laughs> I'm sorry, Clayton. <laughs> um, ASIC 515. Yes. Now, um, you think, or you, I mean, you tend to think that it's as, as important as the Royal Commission. Um, so what's actually happened and what should, shouldn't advisors do? How does it affect them? Okay, so ASIC 515 was an um, investigation and a report um, completed by ASIC into um, uh, advice on the big institutional players. So they sampled a, a, a sample of advice um, and what they basically said um, through a period of time that they, they disagree with um, three quarters of the advice. And not only do they disagree with the advice, they disagree with the way it was audited. Whoa. Okay, and that's really significant. So what that meant was um, there was pushback around the findings because um, we tried. Well, we, people tried to take ASIC through a process of explaining how what an objective looks like, what a strategy looks like, what a product looks like. Mm-hmm. It's not just cost versus cost, um, but largely that fell on deaf ears, and we ended up with a place where we needed to f- uh, fundamentally strengthen um, systems and processes do a thorough training process around, you know, it didn't change a lot, but it actually codified a lot of things around objectives, product comparison, uh, what needs to be kept on file is kind of more like mandatory rather than kind of optional kind of thing. And what, and what are these codes? What, so, what codified that you mentioned? So a lot of licensees uh, looked at things like um, like-for-like comparisons mm-hmm. and made sure that that they were had to be done rather than need, like an optional thing. Right. Um, there's a range of other things. I won't go through it. But basically, um, those licensees are on the hook for um, a period of time that, that has been delivered after 515 came out. So if an independent expert looks at that period and says, I see no real um, improvement, then there's going to be serious implications. So so what I see is that um, the reason I'm calling it out for the mid-tier and lower licensees is that it it is happening at the, for want of a better word, the top end of town. Um, and they're spending a lot of money on the systems and processes. And at some point, ASIC could come down and say, you need to do the same thing. So the question would be, how, how would they line up a program of work to complete that if they, if they are responsible for the licensee? Yeah, right. I mean, a lot of this stuff makes sense to me because I was with Hill Ross and we had to do that. I mean, A&P were always, in, you know, notoriously uh, strict on advisors that it you know because they they had that uh undertaking back in the day um it's it's kind of interesting because um there's still a lot of money that's been paid out to clients from a and p advisors and there's still an absurdly high amount of uh, advice that is quote unquote not compliant um it just it kind of do you think ASIC is looking at this and going, okay, team, we're all trying to get there, but this is taking too long. So we're just gonna gut the whole thing. Is that is that kind of the view? Do you think I don't think that's ASIC's view. I think that ASIC has a role as a regulator across financial services more broadly. Um, yeah. and part of their role is to make sure that everything's in alignment. Um, so they have not just the financial advice area, they've got superannuation, company registration, all the different pieces. Yeah. Um, so I think to answer the question really directly, in the Royal Commission, Hain looked at the fact that they, they've used enforceable undertakings as a, as a tool yes. um, to deal with uh, inappropriate advice. And he looked at the fact that they're kind of uh, working together on press releases and all this kind of stuff is going, what are you doing? You're the regulator in force. So that's in the back of their mind is like how do we how do we bring across the standards and the improvement that we're that we want to see across the board um, so I don't think they're gonna worry too much how we feel about the change and this is why I'm saying it's really time right now to if if you wanted to change the roof while the sun's shining it's right now 
yeah man it's um it's a hard it's just a, a hard time to be an advisor uh the other thing if i can just jump in yeah is um we have like five thousand people working on remediation in this country are they all ex-advisors not all. There's some that are just kind of like they've gone to, you know, Deloitte, PwC. All the big banks have huge teams. Um, but it's a symptom of a wider issue in the sense that um, we focus a lot of our controls and our um, compliance at what I call the bottom of the cliff. So this is where things have already happened and we're trying to fix it. Yes. One of the things that I think that we need to think about as an industry is how we can change our control environment to be at the top of the cliff, which is... We need to change how we think about compliance. So compliance is a word that, you know, as soon as you say it, advisors' faces look down. Uh, we need to think of a better word. But basically, we're trying to do the wrong thing. We're basically looking for, here's an audit of five files once a year that's happened 12 months ago. So that, for me, is not an effective control because it's too late. The, the time to really reduce advice risk, which is what we really should be trying to achieve, is when the advice is given. So when that advisor is sitting in front of that client and that client um, is talking about their contributions history, that's when the risk exists right then. When that advisor forgets to KYC the client, that's when the, the risk exists right then. So I see two opportunities to fix that because I'm always trying to think of how we can solve things. Um, firstly, if, it, if a technology company can look at the end-to-end -end process that an advisor goes through from referral to a product hitting the tin, it's usually about seven or eight systems that are involved there. Yeah, absolutely. And there's usually like over 100 steps. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. And if you looked at that end-to-end -end and provided a system with guardrails, which kind of said, Clayton, you met this client, you forgot to, you asked the wrong question on the contribution history from 2017, go back and ask. You fix it then. So you don't wait 12 months for an auditor to pick it up that goes to a risk and compliance committee that, you know, costs thousands to do that, right? Yeah, I wonder if, you, you know how like, the ATO has has done a lot with my gov to sort of, you know, the other day I actually did my own BAS through my gov and it was oh, wow. insanely simple. Holy damn. Like I used to be a, a tax accountant many, 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 many moons ago and, um, and I used to hate doing BAS and then uh, I asked my accountant just to do a couple of catch-up BASs for me and like charged an arm and a leg and I was like oh god you know I, I'm just going to go see how difficult this is to get done so I called up the ATO and I said you know can you send me through the paper applications and they said actually if you just go into MyGov you can get it you can just get it all done I wonder if if you know in the similar way as the ATO have worked with the government I wonder if there's a tech company out there that's willing to work with the government to get to take those hundred pieces and and make it sort of streamlined because ultimately like the value that an advisor provides is not tied up in the tech that they use no um there might be some you know you might use a flashy bit of tech here to show a lovely uh you know projection graph or whatever but i mean at the end of the day getting the information in the inputs and the outputs are uh, pretty, you know, it's all being legislated, as you've already said. Is it is it worth, is it time for someone just to solve this problem for ASIC, um, create you know, a good bit of software that just does the whole piece and um, and hopefully just cut down on the amount. Like imagine real-time, like red, reg tech, real-time compliance checking that would make everyone's life a lot easier yeah exactly and so you change the concept of compliance to being like best practice dashboards and coaching opportunities so you flip it on its head so people don't kind of roll their eyes when you get up to speak about compliance yeah it's more okay how can we support delivering better quality advice because what i find is when you're speaking to advisors and you start to talk about um, clients and objectives and strategies that's when they get excited because they're engaged in the the formulation of the advice Absolutely, and on the outcome that the client receives. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but all the other stuff, like I think we just need to systematize. Now, it's easier said than done. Oh, um, absolutely. That, that would be. That same theory applies to policies, for example. So everyone, every licensee has got 30 or 40 policies, right? Yeah, it seems crazy that yeah. they're not just all uniform, right? Well, 20 of them, I think, could be uniform. Like, for example, if we just thought differently about it, if we go, 
cybersecurity, privacy, yeah. you know, all these kind Standards. of things. Like they're not, no one, no licensee differentiates on no. that, right? So it's not like anyone's going, actually, I want less privacy. Yeah. <laughs> but the challenge, and the challenge is, again, more complex, is um, you've got FSC, you've got uh, FPA, you've got FASIA, you've got TPB, right? So my hope is the, um, the new Code Monitoring Body 2021. Do you want to be a part of that? Me? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't you should know. definitely. I've be got more. I've got other stuff that I want to do. But anyway. <laughs> um, could actually um, have a policy framework that houses all of that, because one of the challenges when you're in a licensee and you're writing policies, you've got to try and reflect all these different organisations, and some of them don't even talk to each other in terms of their own policies. Well, yeah. So um, we want to get into a position where, when we're, if you're rolling out a policy change to an advisor, you go, "Here's the document." I know you're not going to read it. Here are the four things you need to know. Yeah. So when you give advice, um, you have to do this. It's it's kind of, I mean, if it was a cloud-based piece of tech that was aligned with ASIC, um, you could even update the tech from, uh, from ASIC's point of view so that, you know, the, the advisor would get, a notification in the text so that it wouldn't produce or it wouldn't push through to the next step. Um, I think we need sort of less business as usual ways of thinking about the challenge we're in. Because if we just go back to our 2,500 licensees and try and solve all these problems on our own, yeah, we're kind of taking a knife to a gunfight. That's 100%. And I think the big clear thing is, like, is it worth fighting the regulator? Like that, that's, that's something, you know, I've had a fair few calls over the last couple of days to do with, uh, FASI has had a couple of presentations. One was to the associations and one was to licensees over the last couple of days. So I've had a fair few calls from people that were in those meetings and the differences in opinions is stark. So some people are dead set determined to fight it. The other people are like, actually, it's not as bad as what we thought, um, and there's definitely ways to work together with these guys to make it all happen. Um, do you know yeah. what? I, do you know what I think? What do you think? Yeah, because uh, I'm a Kiwi, I'm going to give you an all black analogy. Yeah, please. Even though they only they lost in the semi final, <laughs> I'm still devastated about it. Um, so the, the turning point for the All Blacks was about 2003. You know, we used to get beaten by John Eels and that, that Australian team oh, oh. all the time. Yeah. Um, they changed the culture. They changed the philosophy. They changed the mentality. It became about making the jersey better, right? So not about so much performance but about the mana and, you know, what they were bringing to the, to the, um, to the All Blacks. And they also, um, after losing a couple of World Cups when we were favourite, um, they changed their mental approach to performance. And what it was about was going from what they call redhead to bluehead. So redhead is I'm emotional, I'm pissed off, I'm kind of like focused on why things are hard, which is kind of really understandable, but not helpful for yep. achieving anything. Yep. Bluehead is I'm really in control, I'm thinking through the process that I need to follow to get to where I need to be. Yeah. So the reason I draw this analogy is I think as an industry we need to get to the bluehead place, which is let's move away from the redhead, acknowledge why the redhead exists, but kind of go like how do we line ourselves up to get through what's going to come 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 for us? Yeah, like I'm I'm super like I mean X Y is all about driving the positive evolution of financial advice, and I wish I could uh, jump onto the bandwagon of saying everything that's new is good. But I like I some of the stuff I'm I read I just go I'm I'm not entirely sure if that is the if that is the positive evolution of financial advice like yeah. I hear the the reasons why decisions are made and I go yes that is the positive evolution of financial advice but how someone's interpreted and then given next steps. I'm, I can't always look at it and go, yes, that will create. Um, because, for example, uh, like I've never used a stockbroker. I'm 36 years old. And from the moment I bought my first shares at, you know, like 21 or 22, I've only ever used a digital broker or I've never used a stockbroker. So I'm not emotionally tied to these guys at all. 
but they make all of their revenue from commissions. Now, can they operate 1st of January 2020? That's a, like, what? I mean, there's a chance that our, because the I was only ever a small parcel of shares purchaser. I was a, I'm a small fry. The big end of town are using stockbrokers. So, yeah. are they? Are they? The turning, honest answer is I don't know. No, no, but like, but, 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 but like, I think it's oh, crazy. Like, what yeah. we're going to freeze the capital markets to prove a point? Like, there are some pretty, and 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 the, and the, the what I just said then is not a crazy interpretation because okay, so our commissions because as you've mentioned before, maybe commissions aren't conflicts and if they're not win a win a chicken dinner but someone just needs to like fully give a hundred percent an answer because we've got this sort of under questioning the answer was given but is that codified and is can we lean on that mm. i mean one of the other interesting things would be uh people who give general advice and people who give intra fund advice um because even though that's not personal advice, they're kind of captured in a sense by the code of ethics. So the question would be, if someone calls up one of their super funds and gets advice, but it's only in relation to their fund, is is that the right thing? I, I don't know. And also, the you know the, the banks have been caught out around general advice as well. So all of these questions we need to resolve. But I, I think one of the things I'd I'd encourage everyone to think about is this is a long term game, right? So if you're in my view, you've got to make a call about whether you're in or you're out in this industry. It's going to be a rough couple of years. It just will be, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of go, I'm in. And if you're in, kind of think through the fact that the code of ethics and all this kind of stuff may well be really positive for the industry in the long term. Yeah, it will be. There's yes. going to be some choppy waters and there's going to be some people that you turn to that may not know honestly the answers to the questions that you've got. But let's be okay with that and just stay together. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm definitely a big fan of that. We, we ask um, every, every other month, we just give it a short little um, questionnaire to everyone. And typically the answer is, in the at least in the XY communities, even during all this period, is the expectation uh, about 80% of people expect to be in the industry for more than 10 years. So, so you talk about you know, making the decision to stay in. Yeah, I, I think a lot, an overwhelmingly large majority of people are making the decision to stay in, which is great because the whole industry falls apart if there's no one there. Absolutely. Right? So, and we can't rely on, you know, a bunch of graduates in 2024 20, no, no, no. because it's going to take them at least five years to, you know, learn to ask really good questions and to understand that money is super emotional and that balance sheets are less important than asking someone where do you want to be in 10 years? And I think we've also got to kind of hold our head up high and say financial advice is extremely valuable for our clients. 100%. The whole shame thing is is an annoying subplot to all of this. Like it's it's almost like uh, as, a, as a whole industry or profession that we're just constantly being shamed. Mm. It's super annoying. And um, and I'd, I'd like to see a bit of respect as well given – to what we do and what we provide. And if you constantly focus on the bad, then sure, you're going to see bad everywhere, but there's so much good that gets done. Um, and that's kind of why I set up Tangelo is to try and help advisors with that journey to get back to that, get to the blue part of the ocean, right? You know, because I think about, um, you know, the average client, you know, the, the couple that comes in and they've got, you know, the, the, their insurance is default in their super, they haven't got a budget, they haven't got wills or powers of attorney, you deliver a bunch of strategies that delivers more value than the fee that they pay. Like that is 80% of clients, right? 100%. So how do we better tell that story? Well, the first thing is we need to be unified as an industry and tell that story. Yeah. So let's not be, as you say, ashamed of it. Let's hold our head up high and say it Say it to the rafters, you know? Um, let's let's dive into just uh, as, a, as a final point um, because we're, we're both pretty passionate about this and when you found out that uh, XY was sort of putting a stamp on it you were like hey this this is this is my jam um, i'm in in short you would say uh it's difficult but not impossible we do have the framework to continue moving forward it's probably better off to work 
uh, with the changes rather than fight against them head on. And for the licensees that are out there that might have listened to this and said, actually, can you give us a hand? How would they reach out to you? So LinkedIn, tangeloconsulting.com.au. I'm going to be at the FPA conference. Love to chat to whoever. Um, I'm really about supporting the industry, trying to trying to fix some stuff that's happened and, and really excited about that. And, uh, and I know you're on the new XY platform and I also know that you come tonight to Melbourne. Which yeah, is where looking forward to it. Where we, where we are recording from right now. So, mate, thank you for coming in. Really appreciate it. It's always super interesting to hear uh, your point of view because I feel like you, you kind of straddle this interesting area where, you know, like you understand the advisor's point of view and you understand uh, ASIC's point of view and you understand sort of the compliance in between and, you know, you don't, you're not pulling any punches. So really appreciate that, mate. Cool, man. Thanks for that. Cheers. Cheers.